my name is Dr. Wells Bramble. I am a third year emergency medicine resident at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm going to be talking about reef tank toxicology. Specifically, we're going to talk about zoanthids, tiny little polyps which contain, or possibly contain, I should say, a very lethal toxin. So here's a marine reef tank for the home hobbyist. Palytoxin is a complex, large molecule. It's been isolated from dinoflagellates, crabs, and these zoanthids. Those are just absolutely beautiful. So here's palytoxin. Probably can see it better on this slide. It has a carbon chain, and it has multiple hydroxylations. It is very toxic. We are going to be going into detail about that toxicity. It was in the 80s and the 90s that the whole hobbyist field of saltwater aquarium reef tank keeping took off. And I think that mostly has to do with advances in the knowledge regarding water chemistry and water purification systems. I think that had a lot to do with it. It's estimated that there are about 600,000 home marine aquariums in the United States. However, it's impossible to know how many of those have zoanthids, how many of those have toxic species within them. The number of Americans who are envenomated by their own home marine aquarium inhabitants is completely unknown. We simply have no idea. The reason for this is many of these envenomations go unreported to local poison centers. Many people probably don't even go to the doctor because their symptoms are very mild. So specifically today we're going to be talking about the order of Zoanthoria. Also includes Palithoa. As you can see, oh, this is just a fantastically beautiful organism, especially when displayed under uh, single wavelength blue LEDs. Just look at that orange, the yellow, the two different shades of blue, just absolutely beautiful. And you can feed these things too, the uh, the elite particulate matter of brine shrimp. So where do they fall in, into the category of cnidarians, which they share with jellyfish? The anthozoans include the zoanthids and uh, palithoa as well, which are also you know, part of the zoanthids. Here is a basic anatomic structure of the zoanthid. You can see that it has an oral disc. When hobbyists feed the organism, uh, the sphincter muscle contracts and it forces the particulate matter that this organism filters, such as brine shrimp, into the oral disc. And then in the actinopharynx, there is some sort of distribution of nutrients that occurs. Additionally, along the capitular ridges in the capitulum, uh, symbiotic photosynthetic algae. This algae, realistically, is bacteria, eukaryotes, as well as dinoflagellates. A single coral, whether it's a zoanthid, is realistically a complex colony of multiple different species, multiple different branches of life. You have animals living there, you have bacteria, you have eukaryotes, you have dinoflagellates. Here's an example of a dinoflagellate. It's encapsulated by a silicate outer wall. These dinoflagellates have also been associated with toxicity. The scientific literature is murky regarding what organism actually creates the palytoxin. Although it has been isolated from zoanthids, and it seems like people seem to associate the toxin as being produced by zoanthids, I think the more likely explanation is it is produced by a dinoflagellate that lives symbiotically with the zoanthid, or it's produced by a dinoflagellate that is consumed by the zoanthid because we've also seen polytoxin in crabs and other invertebrates. We haven't seen it in vertebrates, and I think the reason why is most likely it's toxic to vertebrates, including fish, which have vertebral columns. Ultimately, though, the literature is just not there, and I, at this point I can't tell you for sure where it comes from, but my suspicion is it's dinoflagellate. Regardless of what type of organism produces the palytoxin, it is most commonly associated with exposure to zoanthid. So how do people get exposed? 
typically it's through fracking, which is a process of propagation, or it's transferring from one aquarium to the other, or possibly during upkeep, moving rocks around. People get contact with their skin, epidermal contact, or sometimes they are washing rocks in the aquarium underwater, and the substance becomes aerosolized. Ocular and oral envenomations have also been reported. Here is a image from a CDC case report. It's probably a commonly cultivated variety. And actually, I have this one in my tank. It looks remarkably similar. It includes a case series from Anchorage, Alaska, as well as other proven documented exposures to palytoxin. Let's get into detail about the one from Anchorage, Alaska, which is the first four data points. You see patients A, B, C, and D. That's from one exposure. Basically, in this apartment, they had 70 kilograms of live rock with the previously pictured zoanthid. They're moving that rock into a 200-gallon aquarium. A few of the pieces fell and the coral broke off. They put it all back into the aquarium. There must have been some sort of like an error or a malfunction with the power head or the water pump of the aquarium. The apartment was noted to be misty. The next day, Four people in the apartment, a dog and a cat, awoke with the above symptoms. Interestingly, the aquarium shop owner who had sold them the zoanthids had similar symptoms in the past after handling this particular species of zoanthid. So I've highlighted the most important symptoms that people get from palytoxin toxicity. Importantly, people get a metallic taste. They can also have numbness, tremors, almost everybody had tremors, weakness, paresthesias, fever was also universal, nausea, but no vomiting, that was rare. Theoretically, you could get cardiac dysrhythmia. Almost everybody had myalgias and arthralgias. Other case reports, you can have cutaneous mucous membrane ulceration, and then you can also have conjunctival and corneal inflammation if you have an ocular exposure. So fragging, this has got to be the most common way people are exposed. Now he's going to extract, peel off the rock, a little colony of them to split the colony and make a new colony. So obviously the zoanthids don't like that. You could see them shrink up. They were getting angry. And in the process of doing so, they've secreted this slime. Now the hobbyists online purport that it is this slime that contains the toxic substance, which can cause this. This is an example of a dermal exposure to what is likely palytoxin. Can't be proven because this was just on an online forum. Here is an aquarium store owner from Germany in the process of handling the coral specimen you see on the left. Oh, so beautiful. She got sprayed in the eyes by the secretions. Who knows how that happened? How did she splash herself in the eye with the secretions of this organism? Regardless, the ophthalmologist in Germany diagnosed her with an immunoprecipitate at the limbic border and conjunctival injection. This patient did excellent with levofloxacin and dexamethasone drops. If she didn't get those drops, would she have gone on to develop ulceration or vision loss? Who knows? But this patient did very well. I found this article by Pulley, which just came out June 2018. This is just a fantastic article going into great detail about palytoxin. So they exposed rats either intraperitoneally or with aerosolized palytoxin and its congeners. And you can see the most important thing you got to take away from here is that palytoxin has a 0.041 micrograms per kilogram LD50 in rats. So if you took a 70 kilogram adult human, that would be rounding up three total micrograms of aerosolized palytoxin to be lethal. That is a tremendously potent toxin. Here is the structure of palytoxin again, and you can see where uh, the R groups vary between the congeners and the different toxins that are related to palytoxin, the palytoxin family, so to speak. Palytoxin basically causes the sodium potassium ATPase, which takes the chemical energy bond. When ATP gets turned into ATP, that chemical energy 
is used to power the pump. So sodium leaves the cell, three sodium leave the cell, two potassium come in the cell. Basically it takes this channel, this pump, and opens it up, allowing sodium and potassium to flow with their gradients. So sodium goes into the cell, potassium goes out of the cell. The histology of the lungs. Now, I think this is where the money is. I think this is why the aerosolized palytoxin and its congeners is that much more lethal than when injected intraperitoneally because you can see at T0, you have nice, normal, healthy lung parenchyma. And then at 12 hours, you start to see a little bit of hyaline deposition, some necrosis, at 24 hours, that progresses, and at 48 hours, look how much of the airspace has been completely effaced and replaced by highland membrane disease. This is, must have been like ARDS sort of picture going on. I bet you these rats all died from respiratory failure. Here is rat nasal epithelium. You can see there's a neutrophilic infiltrate, and the epithelial layer is just like sloughing off, completely dead. This is also from aerosolized exposure, but this is the liver. And this is super fascinating because this means that after you've inhaled it, it gets absorbed into the bloodstream and distributed systemically. Real quickly, going from control to 36 hours, you see control is normal. At 12 hours, you start to see a little bit of uh, necrosis, a little bit of congestion. The central lobular necrosis expands at T24 hours, and then at 36 hours, you see diffuse central lobular hepatic uh, necrosis. That's marked by the arrows. Okay, so then going on to cardiac toxicity. Is this also from aerosolized palytoxin exposure. So you see normal myocardium at T zero hours, the control, nice linear striated. At T 12 hours, you start to see some necrosis. Those uh, striations start to become jumbled, so to speak. They're like less linear, less striated because those cells are dying. You're seeing necrosis of the papillary muscle. I guess you could describe it as like a hyper eosinophilic cytoplasm. T 24 hours. Now you start to see an inflammatory infiltrate and further loss of cellular detail, further loss of the normal striated structure of healthy heart tissue. At this point, the only thing we can do for palytoxin exposure is supportive treatment. However, there is an antibody, a mouse antibody, this MAB73D3, which Poli et al., they used to attenuate the effects of palytoxin on hemolysis of RBCs. You can see that as palytoxin concentration in nanograms per milliliter increases, you see the rate of hemolysis sort of asymptote out at around 80%. And you see that for all of the palytoxin and the palytoxin congeners and the mix of the palytoxin and palytoxin congeners, you see that this mouse antibody attenuates the hemolysis. So I don't think this antibody needs to be modified, made safe for administration in humans because it's such a rare exposure and to have an exposure that is that significant that requires um, an antidote uh, has not really been reported. Most uh, exposures uh, are relatively mild, most likely due to a very low inoculum that actually comes into contact with the exposed person. However, palytoxin is extremely, extremely potent. So if there was an outbreak, things can always change in the future. Maybe palytoxin will be identified in future toxic exposures of people who may have been exposed to dinoflagellate blooms. Although the, there's not a clear need yet for an antidote to this toxin, it might not always be be this way. Uh, blooms in the future that create palytoxin and people are exposed to that and have significant toxicity, ultimately requiring an antidote because of the severity of the toxicity. It's also sadly conceivable that because it is such a potent toxin that some terrorist in the future might want to use this as a biochemical weapon. In that case, it would be nice to have an antidote at all, they uh, position themselves nicely that if this emerging toxin takes more prominence, they may in fact be called upon 
in an emergency situation to supply the plasmids that can code for their mouse antibody for modification to make it safe for human administration. Regardless, that's all conjecture. Palytoxin and its congeners, it's an interesting toxin. And some really beautiful organisms make them. Even if it's the dinoflagellates and not the zoanthids that make it, dinoflagellates are really pretty too. Look at this beautiful dinoflagellate. Borrowed this from Getty Images. Well, that's all I've got. Again, if you found this interesting, please follow me on Twitter.